Thanks, Sean. So yeah, this is um, going to be me talking about my PhD work, basically. Uh, and what I'm interested in is how we model fluid cell interactions. So coming up with tools to simulate them more accurately and then understanding the science, uh, using these tools to understand the science behind them. So, you know, matters for shipping, matters for blood flow. Uh, but the two examples that I want to talk about today are from my research. Uh, the first one, so the dead water effect, uh, is something that occurs to boats when they're in water uh, with density stratification. So this can happen when you have fresh water out in the sea and you notice that there's extremely large drag on the boat, which you can see in, uh, in black there. And I'll get into more detail about that effect in the latter half of the talk. Uh, and also I'll talk about iceberg melting and how we can use these methods uh, to better understand how quickly they melt. So uh, that's, that's what I want to get into, but um, the, the key, so what's the key idea behind how we model fluid cell interaction? So the standard way you model fluid cell interaction uh, is as boundary conditions. Um, so you take the Navier Stokes, um, a normal object is represented by no slip boundary conditions. And it's a bit of a hassle because when it comes time to actually simulate this thing, uh, you, when you need to discretize, you need to create a grid that aligns with these boundaries and it needs to move around, or be, you know, it's as complicated as the boundaries are. And that is difficult to do. Uh, and so a way around this is to approximate these boundary conditions instead as forces. So what that looks like here is rather than dealing with a, the no slip boundary condition, uh, we can add a new term into our, our equations, uh, which basically says, oh, sorry, there's zoom is a little bit in my way right now. Um, it's actually obscuring part of the screen. So we put a new term into the equations, which just says when you're inside uh, the object, which is now represented by a function, uh, this function phi, which is zero in the fluid and one in the solid. Inside the solid, you damp strongly with linear damping. Uh, and the, the nice thing about getting rid of this boundary condition and replacing with a force term is that it's easy to put these forces into a code that doesn't have to align with the boundaries. So it makes it easy to simulate. Uh, and there's also some physical uh, motivation behind this method. Basically what we're doing is we're just replacing uh, a solid object by a porous medium. Uh, now, this is an approximation uh, and the approximation has error. And I wanna draw your attention to this little epsilon that I have there. Uh, this kind of determines the error that's gonna occur in our approximation. And what, it, what epsilon physically represents is a length scale. And this length scale is sort of how spread out our approximation is of the object. So by making this length scale smaller, we are able to more accurately resolve uh, the boundaries uh, and turn essentially like a diffuse sponge into a, a highly resolved like piece of sandstone, for example. So by decreasing epsilon, we get more accurate. The problem is that uh, we, well, what we want to do is make sure that this convergence as epsilon goes to zero is quick, right? So th this is the goal here. And to emphasize just um, how important it is to accelerate that convergence, uh, let's talk about the actual cost of doing a 3D simulation. So in three dimensions, uh, the cost of the simulation scales like uh, the number of points you have times the number of time steps you need to take. So in one dimension or in each spatial dimension, you actually need to resolve that length scale epsilon, right? And there's three of those dimensions. And then this, the time step size that you need to take between uh, for every single step is actually size epsilon squared. So what this means is that for a 3D simulation, the cost is going to scale like epsilon to the minus five, right? That's 
really, really expensive to make epsilon smaller. This is why it's so important to make sure that the error converges quickly with epsilon. Now, by default, so if, if the error scales are some power of epsilon, uh, then that means that the effort it is going to take for us to halve our error is going to scale like two to the five divided by alpha. So the bog standard variant of the method I just showed you scales with an error proportional to this length scale. That means halving your error in a three-dimensional simulation is 32 times the effort. It's really, really expensive and inefficient simulations. So it's critical to come up with ways to increase this alpha parameter. And I'm going to talk about how you can uh, get it down uh, up to alpha equals two uh, or even higher. So, so this is the game right now. We, we have these approximate PDEs and we want to increase their convergence rate as we make a small parameter uh, small. We do that using asymptotics uh, and of, the, of the boundary layers. So yeah, basically we can represent these objects with forces and we have fluid flow around them. That's what I'm showing here is the vorticity of fluid flow past this uh, funny shaped beam. And we want to analyze the boundary layer uh, around this boundary. In order to do that, we need a good coordinate system. So um, the nicest coordinate system is Cartesian coordinates. We would like to use that, uh, but for the analysis, it's not so helpful. Cartesian coordinates aren't very useful for the boundaries. So uh, what we want instead when we're analyzing the equations is something that will conform to the boundary. But in general, uh, most coordinate systems uh, aren't going to align with the boundary. Uh, sorry, they, if they align with the boundary, they're not orthogonal. But there is a special coordinate system which satisfies both of these requirements. Right? Um, comes from the sine distance function. Uh, and the way it works is that to get to a point away from your object, you first find uh, the closest point P on the boundary. You find the normal vector at that point, And then you travel in that direction a certain distance. And that distance is the sine distance function. And using this function uh, as a coordinate gives you a really nice orthogonal a coordinate system. And this simplifies mathematical analysis of the boundary layers. Now, it is true that you get coordinate singularities with this coordinate system. But remember, it's for analyzing boundary layers uh, where the system uh, is perfectly fine. We're not going to be dealing with uh, coordinate singularities for boundary layers. And I just want to Reiterate one point. So the sign, this coordinate system is a coordinate system to let us do mathematical analysis of the PDEs. Right? It is not for numerics. The, this coordinate system is uh, and we're not using it for simulations. All the simulations I show you use Cartesian coordinates. The whole point is. Uh, use numerically use Cartesian coordinates uh, with these funny PDEs and then analyze the PDEs with the fancy coordinates just using the maths. But anyway, I uh, hope that, that clarifies things a bit. But okay, we're analyzing boundary layers. Um, <laughs> so we want to look at uh, fluid dynamics in boundary layers specifically, right? The problem is that it's a curvilinear coordinate system. So as I take a vector around, its components are changing, right? And this is for a constant vector field. In fluid dynamics, you're dealing with a vector field that varies in space and in time as well. So there's a lot of uh, derivatives going on that we need to keep track of. So how do we derive vector calculus uh, in this system? So breaks down in three stages again. First, understand the boundary. So we do that uh, using standard surface dif differential geometry. So 
chuck on your coordinates. This gives you tangent vectors. We can normalize them. We can also set them to be orthogonal. Uh, once we've got that, we can take gradients on the surface. We can do integration on the surface, that's fine. We can even take divergences using integration by parts. All very straightforward. Then we need to understand the norm to this boundary. The thing that is so useful about sine distance coordinates is that the normal vector is the gradient of the sine distance. And that tells us straight away a lot of useful facts. First, the gradient of the normal vector has to be, uh, it's the Hessian of the scalar, so it has to be symmetric. And if it's symmetric, then it can be diagonalized. And we already know what one of the eigenvectors is, the normal vector itself. You know, normal vector doesn't change as you move away from the boundary. Because it's symmetric, we know that the other eigenvectors lie, well, they're orthogonal to the normal vector, i.e. they are tangent vectors. So there's these special tangent vectors that are picked out by the normal, the gradient of the normal vector. And these are the principal directions of the surface. And their eigenvalues are the principal curvatures. Uh, and this was all figured out long ago by Euler and Gauss uh, and other people like that. Now, we understand how these coordinates change as we move away from our surface. Right? Um, and the key to it is understanding this scaling factor, which basically just depends on the curvatures as well as the distance from the surface. And once you have this scaling factor, it's straightforward to get the gradient in three in all dimensions. It breaks down into normal derivatives, they're simple, and the tangential derivatives get scaled by the inverse of this factor. And then this, um, this scaling factor also encapsulates a lot of other information about the surface, right? This determinant gives us the mean curvature and the Gaussian curvature. Um, and essentially what we're doing is we're using a coordinate system that is like polar coordinates around each point. Now I'm gonna show a video uh, which just shows us how around each point we can fit the, uh, the coordinates with circles basically. Uh, and the way that the circles fit each level set of the sine distance, yeah, that means, the word for that is osculating. So these circles are osculating uh, with the sine distance function around each point. So they're very useful coordinates. Uh, and the key, what we want to do with them is do uh, analyze boundary layers. So we need to do all the vector calculus. But once you've got the gradient, rest is easy. We have our scaling factor. It gives us a gradient. We can calculate a divergence by integration by parts. We can calculate the curl, just standard vector calculus, right? Curl grad zero, div curl zero. We also want vector Laplacians because um, we're doing fluid dynamics. We've got viscosity uh, and that can be redone in terms of div grad and curl. We can get the vector gradient as well. And importantly, if we're dealing with a boundary that's actually moving over time, we also want to understand how time derivatives change. And they also relate to the velocity of the surface and the scaling factor. But uh, it's a messy slide, it, it is. But the point is that it's one slide. This is everything you need to analyze boundary layers around any shaped object that's smooth in, in using any amount of you know, vector calculus. So this is it, people. Um, and now using this, we want to zoom in, right? We're really interested in understanding the boundary layers of these perturbed PDEs. And we do this with three steps. First, we rescaling our coordinate system. Uh, this in turn rescales all our derivatives, the normal derivatives. And the scaling factor turns into this geometric series. And so these things propagate through all the gradients and the Laplacians and things like that. 
And then finally, we take all of the variables in all of the PDEs, and then we expand all of them in a power series in epsilon. And we compose all these series together and you can step through it order by order. And it's a bit of a mess by hand, but it's simple to automate. You can just do it in Mathematica and it will derive these equations at each order for you. So we now have the machinery to do the boundary layer analysis for these perturbed equations. What does it actually tell us? So using this um, routine, you can look at these penalized equations for fluid solid interactions. And what it tells you is that at leading order, no matter what shape it is or whatever forcing you've got going on, the problem in the limit is always the same. It always looks like this, like coet flow, simplest fluid flow you can possibly get. What we want to happen is this dotted, this dashed black line. Right? We want the fluid velocity to be linear near the boundary and we want it to go to zero at the edge. What actually happens is when you're with the penalty term is it's approximating this with exponential decay inside the object uh, and some importantly some offset uh, as it goes into the fluid. Uh, this error that we get at the boundary is propagating into the fluid and it leads to ordered epsilon scaling. And, and this is a problem because as I said earlier, uh, order epsilon accuracy is gonna make things really slow to converge in three dimensions. So how can we fix this issue? Well, there's still some freedom, right? We can change the shape of our phi function. So the normal way that people would do it is it would be a discontinuous function uh, and it would coincide with the boundary. But you can smooth things out. Now, number one, smoothing is good because uh, it's better for numerics. But in addition to that, if you pick your smoothing just right, it is possible to get your approximate solution to line up exactly with your ideal solution as you're going off into the fluid. Right? So you do still have an order epsilon error at the boundary itself. That always happens because it is the length scale over which it can transition from fluid to solid. But we've fixed it going out into the fluid. So we've localized all our error to the boundary. And in an average sense, the error is now epsilon squared. Um, <clears throat> so that, that alone, this is a really simple fix. You just have to pick your right smoothness and that will get you epsilon squared accuracy. Once you've done that, you can do higher order asymptotic analysis, right? And using simple Richardson extrapolation, uh, you can actually get yourself to uh, epsilon to the power of four conversions. That makes it even more powerful. Uh, so using these techniques is how you're able to generate more accurate methods. Then the question is, all right, you have a method. Uh, what do you want to do with it? So that's what I'll, I'll talk a bit, a bit about now. For anyone interested in, in the details behind the, the numerical method or the maths, uh, you can check out our Journal of Computational Physics paper. So application number one, dead water. Just gonna have some, some water myself. So I showed you a movie before. I'll explain it in a little more detail now. So this movie, uh, there's, there's two panels. On the top, I've got a boat. That's the black oval you can see. Uh, on the top, I'm plotting the density of the fluid. And the point is that dead water involves stratification of the fluid density. So at the top, it's a bit more buoyant. It's fresher than at the bottom. It's only a small variation, so maybe 2%. But that 2% makes all the difference. Uh, and that black bar that you can see in the middle there is just 
trying to filter things out. And what we see is as the boat moves, it up, stirs up the, the fluid, generates waves, and the waves slow down the boat. So that's the basic story of dead water. Um, what I'm going to do now is just get into a bit of the history, why it's interesting, where it came from, and then I'll, I'll talk about what we can actually learn using these simulations. So dead water has been known for a long time. The first person to actually document the effect was this explorer on the left here, Fridjof Nansen. Uh, and he noticed it in his boat, Fram, uh, when he went for his three-year voyage to the North Pole. Um, now, you might be thinking, North Pole in a boat, that doesn't sound right. What his plan was, was to sail to the north of Russia, sail into the sea ice, get stuck, and then kind of ride the ice as it slowly creeps its way over the North Pole and gets spat out uh, north of Canada. Now, unfortunately for him, he didn't quite make it to the North Pole, but I found a lot of other interesting science. I mean, that was the purpose. This was like the, uh, this was the space voyage of its day. It was a scientific endeavor. And one of the things he noticed on this voyage was that occasionally this boat, right, despite being state of the art for 1893, it had an engine, it had um, screw propellers, uh, it would occasionally, despite all this power, get stuck in the middle of the ocean. And he noticed that this boat getting stuck would only happen where there was a surface layer of fresh water resting upon the salt water of the sea. So he's mystified by this. Right? What, what, how could fresh water possibly slow down a boat as powerful as Fran? So three years later, when he got back, he told his colleague Wilhelm Björkness. And it is Wilhelm who hypothesized, he was the first to suggest that the origin of dead water might be the generation of internal waves within the fluid. And these internal waves uh, might be stealing energy from the boat. So we got his PhD student, Walfred Ekman, who's also a famous oceanographer, uh, to investigate. So that's what Ekman did. Uh, more than 100 years ago, Ekman ran hundreds of uh, small scale tabletop experiments uh, and used this data to create a simplified model of dead water. Right? So assuming linearized uh, wave dynamics and constant speed and two dimensions and things like that, the story he gave was basically that dead water is gonna be at a maximum, the drag due to dead water is at a maximum when you're traveling slightly slower than the speed of the internal waves, right? If you're going too slow, you don't excite the waves. If you're going too fast, they can't catch up to you and they can't hurt you. But right around the, the, um, the face speed of the internal waves is when dead water should be strongest. Now, since then, there's been other work. Um, people have, done experiments to see whether dead water might affect swimmers and have caused fair weather drownings. People have also done other uh, tabletop experiments with modern equipment. Uh, and then on the theory side, people have looked at uh, non-linear models of potential flow around the boat or three-dimensional wave dynamics. And it's all been very useful and added to our understanding of the effect. Uh, but for me, there was a couple of downsides. Uh, for one, experiments are slow, expensive, and it's very difficult to measure all the aspects of the flow field when you're running an experiment. Uh, and the downside of the previous theoretical knowledge is that it was either like weakly nonlinear or linearized models. It was at constant speeds. And importantly, they assume potential flow which is a really big simplification of uh, fluid dynamics and prevents a lot of interesting things around shear and turbulence and vorticity from occurring. So we wanted to see what happens when we relax these assumptions and uh, look at a more, more realistic fluid. So what we're doing now is using the methods I've talked about earlier to simulate 
incompressible boost in S hydrodynamics. So this is a you know standard fluid dynamics. We have viscosity. We can generate turbines, and to simulate a boat in uh, strat density stratified waters, we use the volume panelization, which is that stuff I spoke about at the start of the talk. And we're going to look in the same kind of regimes as the tabletop experiments. So Reynolds numbers around 10,000. And we're interested in that range of the peak effect where you're moving at the wave speed of the internal waves. Uh, so it's true number roughly one. So I'll show you uh, an expanded version of the simulation uh, I showed earlier and actually get into a bit more of the details. So we have the boat. It's a volume penalty. I'm plotting the density on the top. Next, I'm plotting the vorticity of the flow. Uh, so this is going to show how the, the flow becomes turbulent due to the action of the viscosity. We're also going to plot the pressure. And then in the bottom, I'm plotting the drag and the velocity. And I want you to pay attention to, uh, well, I want you to pay attention to everything because there's something interesting in each panel here, right? So as the boat starts out, it, not much is happening, but it starts to generate an internal wave. And then eventually, if you look at the vorticity panel, all the vorticity being shed from the shear layer of the boat starts to uh, clump up together. Right? And, and then it forms this coherent vortex. And the vortex, as it spins up, it starts to move forward and then it catches up to the boat, uh, which is right when the boat is feeling the peak effect. And then it kind of collides. And then as it collides, you can see that the drag in the red line in the bottom goes way down. And then the effect goes away, boat speeds back up, starts to outrun the wave. Uh, and then it gets caught and then the vortex hits it and then it escapes dead water again. So there's a lot of interesting things going on here. Um, the key takeaway is that we're seeing something that was not previously observed. Right? We're seeing trailing vortices. Right? These cannot occur in the previous potential flow models, and they're really hard to spot uh, by eye. Um, so we see the trailing vortices. Also, I'll point out that big black bar that you see moving through the domain with the boat is essentially just a filter to make sure that the, um, the wake of the boat doesn't hit it uh, back from the front. So we're doing these simulations in periodic domain. Okay. So we observe vortices in dead water. This was the state of affairs for a long time with this project. And so what I wanted to do next is try and answer, okay, well, we know there's vortices. What exactly are they doing? So here I'm going to show two different simulations and we try and isolate the influence of the vortex. So on the top, I've got a simulation just like I showed you before, right? There's a incompressible fluid dynamics, it's uh, dead water moving past the boat. Um, we're now in the frame of the boat, so the boat's not gonna move, the water's flowing past the boat. But as the water flows past the boat, it generates this vorticity. The vorticity will coalesce into a trailing vortex. In the second panel, I'm going to compare that to a boat which is much more like the previous idealized models of dead water. This is going to be a boat with no shear boundaries. It's not going to generate um, any vorticity at the boat boundary. So I, in this way, using these different boundary conditions on the boat, I can see exactly how the existence of a vortex changes dead water. And so on the bottom, I'm going to compare the drags of the two simulations. And this is a shorter simulation, so I'll have it on repeat. But what we see is in the top, with, with the real boat in viscous fluid, it is generating vortices. Uh, and this does not happen without having no slip boundaries in the second simulation. And the question is, okay, what does the vortex do? What's different between these two simulations? And we can see that 
what the vortex is doing in the top is it's constantly colliding with the bot, right? And as it collides, it's depressing the wave. And at that instant that the vortex collides with the boat, the drag of the top simulation goes down. So what we can see here is that the vortices depress the wave and thereby decrease the drag of dead water. So what this tells us is that the previous models of dead water are going to overestimate the effect because they can't capture this phenomenon. They cannot capture the fact that vortices are able to kind of kick you out of dead water. Now, everything I've said up to now has an important caveat. These are two dimensional simulations. And that, that makes an important difference. We know that turbulence in three dimensions and in two dimensions behaves differently. In two dimensions, vorticity likes to clump together, form these big vortices. In three dimensions, the forward energy cascade means that it likes to break things apart. So an important question you will answer is, all right, but is this vortex just a 2D effect? So I want to show you something I just got to that. Um, so, okay. This is a 3D simulation of the previous uh, effects. Now, I'm going to apologize for the jitteriness of the video. Uh, I don't actually have access to this data. It was run on a different supercomputer. So I cannot, I, can't, I couldn't make the movie as nice as I wanted. But I'll try and explain exactly what's going on. So here, it's just like before, except now we have a third dimension for the fluid to move in. And that third dimension lets the turbulence behave the way it does for real boats. And in the top, what I'm plotting is the horizontal velocity of the flow. So red means forward toward the boat, blue means backward. And we can see that there's this overturn behind the boat which is acting a lot like a vortex. So this, that feature that we identified previously is still persists in three dimensions. So we expect it to happen in the real world. And in the bottom, we can see that this vortical feature, this recirculating feature, is kind of colliding with the boat again, and it is depressing the wind. So we're seeing the same kind of thing in 3D. It's, this is very pre preliminary results at this stage, but I, I had to show it. I'm just so excited about this 3D simulation that I finally got, which is reproducing the things that we had seen in two dimensions. <laughs> um, but yeah, much more to come, much more to come. Point is dead water. Um, we can use these methods to identify a new phenomenon or a new aspect of the dead water phenomenon, which is that vortices play an important role uh, and that might even be a, a helpful way of trying to get out of dead water. So there we go. That was application number one. Now for application number two. So I'm going to talk now about melting icebergs. Um, now. Can I ask you a question, Eric? Yes, Martin. You may ask me. Anyone may ask me a question at any time. Oh, yeah. Just so I don't understand. Um, because you, you, you excite basically like the wave with, with moving on top, yeah? yeah. The, boat, the boat is, is based like its own enemy because it, there, there is no wave prior, it's only because the, the boat is moving, yeah? So it's exciting it basically like that. So, so the, the, the simple answer would be like, I just speed up a little bit, so I'm always ahead of the wave, so all is good. But is that actually just a catch 22 is if I, I mean, do it an excite is like a different mode. I mean, what I mean, it has to do probably with the ratio between the two layers, I assume, as with the width. But um, is it uh, because it looks like it looks like surfing, yeah? You, you, you try to it's exactly it. what it is, Mark. It's yeah. exactly surfing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're surfing an internal wave now, yeah, yeah, uh, 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 surface wave, but that is what it is. But is that is it usually like so that the so the sweet spot for it for getting an excited wave, which has roughly the speed of a boat is, is very natural, like with respect to the, the layer that usually is out there in the fjords or whatever it is like that. Is that, that's yeah, why yeah. it's so common or something like that. So, so like, is the question like, 
what's the kind of typical internal weight speed. Yeah, exactly. It's, yeah, it's not particularly fast. Uh, it turns out to be pretty commensurate with the kind of sailing boat speeds that people were dealing with, um, you know, like a uh, hundred years ago. It's a, on the order of several knots, 10 up to something like that. Once you go faster than that, we should be okay, right? Jet skis, jet skis are out on surface waves, so they're golden, uh, but not everything is a jet ski. So we, we will expect to see it for slower vessels. And in that case, if you can outrun the wave, you'll be okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but the process of getting there can be quite difficult because what, you know, what we see in this, um, that top simulation is that, so, so the way it works here is, you know, I'm just pushing on the boat with a constant force and seeing how it evolves. And it does escape the dead water, but it can get caught in it again. Sure. Um, so you can, it, it might need a really big push. <laughs> anyway. Can I, can I say something? Yes. Yeah, I, I want to tell a little story that's kind of Eric's story, but um, I, I, so we've been apparently a, a pilot in Newcastle Harbor has uh, noticed Eric's work and contacted us and then Eric corresponded with him a bit, but uh, he asked is dead water because he knows about dead water, you know, so, so these are guys that are landing, that are, that are driving ships and undocking them. And he knows, he knows about dead water. And uh, I, I, Eric asked him, well, do you have a problem with it? He goes, no, 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 no. We just turn up the, we just turn up the gas. It was laughable to him. It was like, no, 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 these ships are so powerful. Um, I've talked to kayakers personally who say that it's a problem because you can't paddle fast enough. So for, for small things, it's, it's really an issue. Um, but apparently for the big ships, it can be a problem when they're close to the dock. The herky jerkiness can smash you into it bad. So it's not just about getting free. And yeah. then, of course, like Nansen had a hard time because their boat, even though it was the most powerful in the world, still wasn't that powerful. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it's. Yeah, that's right. I just, yeah, you, you should elaborate more if you want, but like, tell them about the pilot. Yeah, yeah, that's right. No, it's it's uh, big boats near docks. Suddenly you have internal waves interacting with the walls of the port, right? And then that can really slosh around in, in complicated ways that are difficult for pilots now. So yeah, no, lots of cool stuff with dead water. Lots of cool stuff. Um, but yes. There is a, a part three, a part two of the applications. Melting icebergs. So question one, why does anyone care about icebergs? Um, so yes, they are a shipping hazard. Too soon. It can be dangerous. Um, but they're more than just a shipping hazard, right? They insert nutrients into the ecosystem, but they also represent one of the largest transports of fresh water from ice sheets into the oceans, right? And they freshen the oceans as they melt. They represent like 40% of Antarctic fresh water transport. And in doing so, they can, you know, affect things like the Gulf Stream. Like famously, this is what the, the Day After Tomorrow movie was premised on, right? You upset the Gulf Stream and you can really screw up the Earth's climate. So. Icebergs play a lot of important roles beyond just being shipping hazards. Uh, they do lots of other interesting things as, as they melt, they change shape, they can roll over, uh, they, and as they tip around, it, it's, um, it's a pretty big event, and this is why I shouldn't go near icebergs. Uh, and actually just recently, or a couple months ago, uh, icebergs were in the news. So in November last year, Oceanographers noticed that uh, one of the larger icebergs ever, uh, iceberg A68, was on a trajectory for the South Georgia Islands. Uh, and this was going to be a problem because it was the size of the South Georgia Islands. And if it had collided, you know, it was a hundred, hundreds of kilometers long, it would have upset the you know, ecosystem and shipping and all things like that. And fortunately, at the last minute, it ended up swerving to the right and breaking apart. But uh, it would have been a big deal if it had hit. And so icebergs uh, can, can play really important roles 
one of the most important things to understand about them is uh, knowing how quickly they met. And so the goal of this investigation was to try and understand specifically how does the shape of icebergs affect their melting? Uh, because as it turns out, icebergs come in a huge range of shapes and sizes, down from the smallest ones at 10 metres in size through the largest iceberg ever recorded, iceberg B15, which was 300 kilometres long. So they can have a bit of variance. Uh, and, and this is all uh, work that was recently published in Physical Review Fluids. Um, so we want to know how quickly icebergs melt. And the first people to investigate this question, Wicks and Campbell, uh, looked at it 50 years ago because what they were interested in was could you tow icebergs from Antarctica to use as an economic source of fresh water in Chile and Perth? Um, so in order to answer that question, they needed to know, well, is it gonna melt on the way? And so they came up with the first parameterization, first model of uh, melting icebergs. And it's a simple model, it basically says that the melt rate of the iceberg should be proportional to the temperature of the water, uh, should be basically proportional to how fast you're moving uh, and weakly dependent on the size. And it's a useful model, but it is, of course, a model that has some, it misses some aspects. Like, for example, if you aren't moving, this model says that you aren't going to melt, and that's not really realistic. So the original intent of the project was to do some laboratory experiments and compare the measured melting to the models that we set. So we had a saltwater flume. Uh, it's recirculating room temperature salt water through it. And in that, we put a dyed blue block of ice. And we vary the velocity of the tank water as well as the dimensions of the ice and see how this affects the melt rates. And we saw quite a few interesting things. For example, at high speeds, the first thing that really stood out when we ran these experiments is that the melting is completely not uniform, right? It melts three times faster off the front than it does off the other sides. And within each face, it, the melting is itself not very non-uniform. So there was a pronounced hot spot behind the front on the bottom, right? None of this was predicted by the previous models, right? So when we did all the experiments, put all the profiles on top of each other and compare to what the models predict. The models didn't predict, first of all, they, they underestimated melting in general, and they did not capture any of the non-uniformities that we observed. So we wanted to make a better model and understand why the previous ones didn't work, what's really going on in the experiments. So for that, we turned to simulation. So it's going to be similar kind of ideas as to you know, dead water and volume penalization. Uh, now it is a bit more complicated, right? We're dealing with a melting object. So in order to, uh, to deal with a melting object, now we have to evolve our function phi that represents the ice, uh, ice versus water ratio. And in order to describe melting, in salt water, you now need to have a new equation to solve for the ice. The equations are a little complicated. They're basically like an Allen Kahn type equation. But the gist of what it's saying is that if the temperature is high, you should melt. And when you melt, you absorb temperature or you absorb heat. That's it. Um, <clears throat> and by simulating these models and also incorporating the effect of salinity, uh, you can simulate melting ice in salt water. So this is a temperature field of a block of ice melting in salt water. Now, again, uh, there's epsilons in our equations. So you can do this same uh, 
steps of analysis to understand the causes and the error and cancel out the leading order terms. Uh, and the details of that are in our proceedings A paper. But the point is, we can simulate melting ice and salt water. Isn't that cool? What can we do with it? So in the experiment, we saw that the melting was really non-uniform. And so we can simulate it. So on the bottom, we ha I have a simulation of which shows the temperature field of fluid flow as it moves past the ice, which is cold and therefore black. And on top of that, I'm plotting the melt rate at each point in space and time in red. And we can see that the simulations of melting ice are reproducing the key aspects of melting icebergs, namely the melting is faster off the front than off the bottom. The average melt rates of each face actually agree quantitatively with the experimental values, which previous models could not do. And it's reproducing the patterns of melting that we observe, where we see that somewhat behind uh, the front, we again see this localized hotspot of increased melting. Now, it's a 2D simulation, yes, but key thing, it's reproducing the experiment. That's the ultimate test here. So we wanted to interrogate these simulations to understand what is driving some of these effects, like what's with the increased melting at the bottom. So if we plot it, we can see that as the fluid comes past, it's generating this shear layer. The shear layer becomes unstable, generates vortices. Uh, and these vortices seem to be associated with enhanced melting. And if we take a snapshot of the vorticity field, we can see this process happen, right? The vortices are upwelling warm ambient water, which you can see in the, in the um, velocity plot here. And they bring that warm water up to the base of the ice. And when they do that, we can see clearly a localized increase in melting. Now, this is just one snapshot. Um, we can actually show it for all times by plotting the melt rate of, at each point of the base for all times in a space time plot. And what we see is, yeah, the melting, it's very non uniform and it seems to be enhanced in the middle. And we can show that it is the vortices that drive it by plotting their location over time. So here in the gray, this is where you can detect the vortices in the fluid flow. And we see that it is the generation of vortices that creates these mixing events that are bringing up warm water and leading to localized enhancement of the melt rate uh, and this non-uniform melting that wasn't captured by previous models. So there you go. That is, that's where I'll stop today. So the, the takeaways are that we have methods now to accurately and simply simulate fluid solid interactions. Uh, we have the mathematical tools to analyze these um, systems and improve their convergence and make them more efficient. And using them, uh, we can answer real scientific questions about dead water, um, showing how important vortices are to the effect, and develop improved models of iceberg melting. Um, so there you go. Thank you for listening. Any questions?